alkenes and alkanes and simple dihalides, vinyl sulfoxides and tertiary amides, orbitals hybridized to sp3. I will catch fire if I sing out of key. Oh boy, here we go. The big one. Listen, I'm gonna level with you guys. I've been dreading making this episode. Trying to sum up the chemical properties of carbon in a single video is like trying to cram an elephant seal into a milk bottle. It's not a question of how you do it, it's a question of how many bits you've got to hack off with a bread knife. I mean, obscure elements, those I could handle. I've only got to write like three facts an episode and then I can knock it off for the evening and get stuck into me tea. But carbon is quite possibly the most important element in chemistry, ever. It's the basis for all life in the universe and it can be found in some shape or form in nearly every animal, plant and consumable resource on planet Earth. Oh, Oh, sure, the hydrogen in the sun keeps us from freezing to death, and the oxygen in the air stops us from suffocating, but the sheer number of useful carbon compounds known to science makes the rest of the periodic table shrink up with shame like a chilly breeze through a nudist colony. Carbon chemistry is such an enormously important field of research that chemists had to split their entire field of study down the middle just to keep things organised. The study of carbon-based compounds is called organic chemistry. Nothing to do with pesticides or overpriced fruits, that's just what we decided to call it. Meanwhile, the umbrella term inorganic chemistry refers to the study of literally every other element in existence. It seems a bit imbalanced, but trust me, it really is that heavily split. The terms organic and inorganic are used by literally every chemistry department in the developed world, but the distinction is nowhere near as cut and dry as I'm making it sound. Carbon atoms have four electrons available for bonding, and they can use them to form networks of covalent bonds, both with itself and a slew of common elements across the table. Compounds with lots of carbon-carbon bonds are the ones that organic chemists tend to focus on. You know, the ones with lots of zigzags and hexagons that look like they've been drawn by a man with triangles for hands. But this isn't the only sort of bonding that carbon can participate in. Carbon atoms are more than happy to form bonds with metals too, and they can free frequently be found in traditionally inorganic structures like metal complexes and minerals. So what about these molecules? Are they organic or inorganic? Acceptable answers are A, both, B, neither, or C, no one cares, ask a more interesting question. Now to stop this episode from being about four hours long, I'm going to limit this episode to a handful of carbon heavy materials, specifically three of its allotropes and two or three of its compounds. Now I can already hear the organic chemists in the comments screeching with rage like nerdy velociraptors, but worry not. As I said, I'm not exactly struggling for content here. Topics like organic synthesis and functional groups are interesting and they definitely deserve videos of their own, so I'd rather cover them properly in separate videos and awkwardly crowbar everything into a single one. Speaking of awkwardly crowbarring things into other things, I'd like to give a quick rundown of all of Carbon's amazing applications that I didn't have space in my script for. So with no further ado, I'm going to name as many Carbon derivatives as I can in 30 seconds without looking anything up on the internet. Ready, go. Uh, plastics, DNA, um, fibres, um, antibiotics, crude oil, um, paper, sugar, TNT, uh, alcohol, L LSD, uh, organic solvents, um, v vinegar, uh, like most proteins, um, enzymes, uh, oh god, uh, carbon steel, vinegar, uh, cellulose, swans, benzene, um, uh, antibiotics, oh no, I said that. Mm. Ah, damn. Wait, did I, did I say swans? <laughs> Carbon's name comes from carbo, which is the Latin name for coal, a black sedimentary rock that just so happens to be the largest source of energy on the planet. Coal is what is known in the biz as a fossil fuel, a compound formed from the pulpified remains of ancient organisms deep within the Earth's crust. When heated, the carbon in coal reacts with oxygen in the air to release an enormous amount of energy in the form of heat. Unfortunately, this reaction produces a gas you may have heard of called carbon dioxide. Now, this isn't a bad thing necessarily. CO2 is produced naturally by every animal on Earth through respiration, and in low concentrations, plants can convert it into sugar via photosynthesis, but in high concentrations it will build up in the atmosphere and prevent heat from escaping into space, slowly leaving the planet to cook in its own juices like tinfoil around a big blue jacket potato. Now this is standard fare for fossil fuels, but coal is a particularly dirty source of energy. In practice, coal is never found in nature as pure carbon. Burning it releases a slew of awful pollutants like sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, and heavy metal residues like mercury and lead. As for carbon's allotropes, the best place to start is graphite, a grey, slippery mineral used to make pencil lead, which for clarification is never made out of actual lead. I mean, unless your local stationery shop is trying to poison you. Graphite's slipperiness is a byproduct of its atomic structure. Sheets upon sheets of carbon atoms bonded together in a hexagonal honeycomb lattice. These sheets are kept glued together by weak intermolecular interactions known as van der Waals forces, and they are so weak the sheets can be rubbed off of each other with next to no effort. This is why pencil lines will easily smudge if you rub your fingers against them, as many a fine art student has learned to their chagrin. When extracted, single layers of graphite are referred to as graphene, or 2D graphite if you want to annoy mathematicians. Graphene conducts electricity and heat incredibly efficiently, and its discovery in the 2000s led to a gold rush in materials researchers trying to use it in batteries and computer chips. Despite only being fully characterised a decade or two ago, the extraction process for graphene is trivially easy on the small scale. Just buy a big block of graphite, then rip off some of its surface with sticky tape. I'm serious, this was in a journal and everything. It's even got a name. The scotch tape method. 
bloody Americans. Next we have diamond, which despite being made from the same chemical ingredients as graphite, is about as different a substance as you can possibly get. Diamond is one of the hardest materials known to man, but it is also one of the prettiest. Billions of pounds of diamond jewellery are sold every year around the world, usually in the form of earrings and necklaces. The high market value of diamond led to a wave of forgeries in the jewellery industry, particularly in the early 20th century. Back in the day, it wasn't uncommon for crooked jewellers to pass off inferior gemstones as diamonds. The geological record is chock full of colourless stones, and if your customers didn't know what to look for, you had a near countless number of gems to swap your diamonds with. However, there are a few ways to check you aren't being sold a sneaky forgery. A classic technique used by jewellery experts is the fog test. Give the diamond a quick clean with a cloth, then put it up to your mouth and fog it up with your breath. A real diamond will dissipate the heat from your mouth almost immediately. So if the surface is sufficiently clean and the air isn't particularly humid, any fogginess will clear up after a second or two. However, if your diamond stays foggy for longer than four seconds, or failing that the first verse of Happy Birthday, you're almost certainly looking at a fake. Now, this test isn't absolutely foolproof. Forgeries are getting better by the day, and the only surefire way to check if your diamonds are real is to have them x-rayed by a professional. But it's cheap, it's quick, and in a pinch it'll save you from being embarrassed at any mineralogy conferences or masquerade balls. Diamonds are naturally produced in the Earth's crust, where super high temperatures and pressures crunch the carbon atoms together into super strong networks of covalent bonds. Up until the 50s, the only way to get diamonds was to dig very, very deep holes in the ground and hope you didn't lose too many people to a mine collapse in the process. To this day, the diamond industry is horrifically regulated, particularly with regards to child slavery, which let's face it, even by my standards, is a pretty grim topic to start cracking wise about. However, chemists have since found ways to starve demand for blood diamonds by making their own. The American engineer Tracy Hall is credited with the first synthetic diamond, and he developed his methods while working as a researcher at General Electric. Hall used an enormous steel press to subjugate powdered carbon to the same pressures and temperatures found within the Earth's crust. After half an hour of insane pressure, the hatch would be lifted to reveal a dazzling collection of miniature diamonds. General Electric made billions off of Hall's work, and his reward would go down as one of the most memorable displays of gratitude in scientific history. In recognition for his groundbreaking accomplishment, Dr. Hall was awarded a $10 savings bond. Oh, groovy, smashing, yay capitalism! <laughs> so, I think that'll do for today. I ignored basically all of Carbon's compounds and I didn't even cover all of its allotropes properly. I mean, there's over 500 of them, so I can't beat myself up too much, but still. Out of all the videos I've done so far, I really do want to come back to Carbon someday. There's just so much left to talk about, and I've got a nagging feeling I've left this video a bit unfinished. Ah, I'll be fine.